Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Atlanta Council. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President here at the Council, and it's a pleasure to host all of you uh, for what I think is a very timely event, a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, at which we're honored to welcome Advisor for National Security to the Prime Minister of Japan. We're del delighted to have Mr. Kentaro, uh, Kentaro Sonooro with us today as our keynote speaker. Welcome, welcome to Washington, welcome to the Atlantic Council. I want to frame today's conversation with just a few thoughts. Uh, for us at the Council, the Indo-Pacific region uh, is a pretty obvious focal point, encompassing three of the world's largest economies, seven out of the eight fastest growing markets. In the coming years, the region is expected to produce more than half of the world's economic output. Yet the rules-based economic order in Asia is growing increasingly strained. Several countries have expressed concern about China's steadily increasing influence across the region. Many have been wary of the Belt and Road Initiative. Yet at the same time, there's no doubt that the initiative could play an important role in promoting economic development. Leading democracies will need to seek opportunities to shape the initiative in ways that are both conducive to European and Asian growth and consistent with our shared interest. No doubt China's presence is global, from the stalemate of the Korean Peninsula stretching across Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and influence regimes and markets along the way. So during this historic and transitional moment globally, Asia's strategic importance for the United States grows ever greater. Over the past half century, adherence to a common set of principles has been vital to ensuring that countries throughout Asia are able to prosper from the global economy, regardless of how great or small they may be. And it's throughout this time that the alliance between the United States and Japan, that it's been at the forefront of safeguarding this order. As the largest and third largest economies in the world both hold considerable sway in shaping the dialogue on global trade, as well as global security. But more than that, our two countries share foundational values which fir with firm commitments to principles such as democratic governance, freedom of navigation, and the rule of law. This shared foundation has enabled the countries to work together to propose a restored vision for the region, if you will, one that we'll talk about today, a free and open Indo-Pacific. So while this term may seem new, its roots are hardly so. Connectivity across the Indian and Pacific Oceans dates back millennia, of course, and ships have been traversing today's routes since well before the internet or modern supply chains. But I think we believe in our team that it's crucial now to reinvigorate those connections, ensuring that the region's development remains an effort in which all nations can participate. It's a connection in which we at the Atlantic Council share a deep interest. So I'd like to take it a step um, further by emphasizing the need to engage Europe cooperatively in the Pacific with Pacific powers towards achieving the shared goal of growing economic prosperity. So at the Atlantic Council over the past few years, I've been proud to see our own efforts in Asia grow at such a rapid pace. Today's event is part of the series of programming where at the Atlantic Council, we've been incubating our Asia initiative within the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security led by Barry Pavel, who you'll be hearing from later this today. The effort's been founded on the need, now more than ever, to build international coalitions cap capable of tackling today's global challenges. And across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, countries and communities that once maybe thought they had little to do with each other now face many common challenges and must enter into what we're calling our Trans-Atlantic Pacific Partnerships to solve them. So we're very sympathetic to and supportive of the mission of our Japanese allies and other counterparts who are engaging in the inspiring and necessary work together to bring partners together across the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Japan's international engagement can serve as a model as they've been reaching out to partners and countries from Bangladesh to Laos to Sri Lanka. So as such, it's truly my privilege to introduce one of the officials at the forefront of this Japanese strategy. Mr. Sonoura currently serves as National Security Advisor to Prime Minister Abe, as well as a member of the Japanese House of Representatives. He was first elected in September 2005 and has since worked extensively on foreign affairs, most significantly serving as State Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, from August 2016 
uh, for a year. Mr. Sonorawa has also held a number of other positions as a member of the House of Representatives, most recently including director on the Committee of Budget. And before he joined the House of Representatives, he enjoyed a decade-long career uh, with Yomiuri Shimbuma leading Japanese newspaper. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Sonorawa to the stage to deliver his remarks. We're delighted to have you at the Atlantic Council and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak here today at the Atlantic Council, which has a long and distinguished history in Washington, D.C. Today, I'd like to talk not about the Atlantic, but about the Indo-Pacific. Where did it come from? The concept of free and Indo-Pacific has its origins in the speech that Prime Minister Abe gave at the Parliament of India in 2007 entitled Conference of the Two Seas. Allow me to quote from the, that speech. The Pacific and the Indian Oceans are now bringing about a dynamic coupling as seeds of freedom and of prosperity. Our two countries have the ability and the responsibility to ensure that it broadens yet further and to nurture and enrich these seeds to become seeds of clear transparency. In November last year, when President Trump visited Japan, our leaders affirmed that Japan and the United States still work together to promote peace and prosperity in the region by developing the Indo-Pacific as free and open. The importance of, free, of a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy was advocated in Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's speech at the CSIS in October of last year and also President Trump's remarks at the APEC CEO summit in November of last year. Why is it that Japan has been able to obtain the commitment from the US about this concept? What was the trick? It's obvious. We are second to none in sales. <laughs> when the Trump administration was inaugurated, people wondered what will follow the Obama administration's rebalancing policy towards Asia? There was growing anxiety over the receding U.S. presence in the region, especially after the president announced to withdraw from TPP. I think the Trump administration was looking for a broad strategic framework that could prove such anxiety is baseless. This background, I believe, led to the U.S. adopting the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. When all is said and done, the United States commitment and presence is indispensable to ensure the stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. And where this point is concerned, I sincerely welcome that President Trump is making a United States definitive commitment to the Indo-Pacific region clear. Now, who is the key person in the U.S. government adopting this strategy? I leave it to you to make a guess. As a promoter of this strategy, today I'd like to present a simple explanation of what the free and open in the Pacific strategy is and provide food for thought for both Japan and the United States to pursue this goal together. Why is the Indo-Pacific not the Asia-Pacific? The reason is simple. The common challenges we face are shared not only in the Asia-Pacific, but also in the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific region stretches from the Asia-Pacific through the Indian Ocean to the Middle East and Africa, and is the core of the world's vitality, supporting more than half the world's population. The maritime order in the Indo-Pacific is exposed to various threats including piracy, terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, natural disasters, and illegal fishing. What is the purpose of the free and open in the Pacific strategy? That is, to ensure the stability and prosperity of not only this region, but of the world as a whole as a result of maintaining and strengthening a free and open maritime order based on the rule of law in this region, and 
by making the seas global commons that bring stability and prosperity equally to all countries. This strategy is composed of three pillars. I'll introduce them to you today. First, the promotion and establishment of fundamental principles such as the rule of law and freedom of navigation. Unilateral attempts to change the status quo by force continue in the Indo-Pacific region. In order to maintain and strengthen a free and open maritime order based on the rule of law, it will be necessary to comply with international law, including United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. In addition, concrete actions and cooperation to ensure freedom of navigation are essential. Japan st strongly supports the freedom of navigation operations by the United States. Furthermore, Japan will utilize multilateral frameworks such as the EAS and IORA, so-called multilateral frameworks and collaboration such as Japan-India-Australia, Japan-US-India, and Japan-US-Australia cooperation. And furthermore, seminars such as this emphasize the importance of freedom of navigation and the rule of law, and by doing so, strives to make those principles universal and consolidated. The second pillar is the pursuit of economic prosperity through enhancing connectivity, including through quality infrastructure development in accordance with international standards. The infrastructure needs that exist in the Indo-Pacific region are enormous. Enhancing regional connectivity is vitally important for ensuring the stability and the prosperity of the region as a whole. For many years, Japan has been cooperating with countries in the region to advance their national and economic development. This refers to the improvement of physical connectivity, including ports, railroads, and roads, improvement of people-to-people -people connectivity through human resource development, and improvement of institutional connectivity through facilitating customs and procedures. Freedom and democracy, the rule of law, and market economics have already taken root in Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia, and confidence, responsibility, and leadership are building. We widen this success in Asia to the Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific Island countries in, in order to extract the potential of those regions and enhance connectivity between the Asia Pacific and the Middle East and Africa. Japan intends to promote the stability and prosperity of the wider region as a whole as a result of creating an economic zone, including promoting private sector business and developing the business environment. We envision an era in which a sophisticated value chain tied together with ASEAN countries, such as Myanmar, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. <laughs> Southwest Asian countries, such as India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and furthermore, Middle Eastern countries, such as men, African countries, such as Kenya, Mozambique and Madagascar and Pacific Island countries such as Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and Palau. Also, toward that end, comprehensive initiatives that include not only the development of the business environment, but also remote island development and energy development will be important. In developing infrastructure, we need to conform ourselves to international standards what is important? That is openness, transparency, economy, financial viability of recipient countries, safety, job creation and capacity building, and social and environmental consideration. In this regard, Japan is promoting the development of quality infrastructure while also striving to spread and consolidate international standards. Japan is well prepared to advocate alongside the United States and to act with the United States in order to create international rules. 
Securing capital as well as ensuring quality is important to respond to enormous infrastructure, infrastructure demand. To fill gaps in capital, Japan will coordinate with the ADB while striving to supply capital for infrastructure via the initiative for expanding the export of high quality infrastructure and will promote the utilization of public capital that encourages the mobilization of private sector capital. The third pillar of the strategy is initiatives for ensuring peace and stability. They include assistance for capacity building or maritime law enforcement. In order to counter threats such as piracy, terrorism, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, we need to facilitate cooperation on anti-piracy measures, counterterrorism, and non-proliferation. It's also important to strengthen support for enhancing the maritime law enforcement capabilities of coastal states by providing patrol vessels, improving maritime domain awareness capabilities, and holding joint exercises. Japan and the United States are making progress with specific coordination in the area of supporting Southeast Asian countries with building their maritime law enforcement capacities. Japan intends to further strengthen these concrete initiatives going forward. The United States and India in particular play a key role in ensuring maritime security in the Indo-Pacific region. In this regard, we welcome the joint Japan-US-India exercise, Marabar, and hope to further strengthen such initiatives. In November last year, Japan Coast Guard, together with the United States Coast Guard, held an exercise in the Philippines with the Coast Guard of Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Furthermore, last month, Jap the Japanese patrol vessel, Tugaru, was dispatched to India and Malaysia. And upon arriving at the port of Chennai, it held combined anti-piracy and other exercises with the Indian Coast Guard. The Sri Lanka Coast Guard and the Maldivian Coast Guard participated as observers. And a large number of personnel from Coast Guard organizations in countries in the Indo-Pacific region also observed the exercises. I visited the site of exercises and explained the important position that such initiatives occupy in the Indo-Pacific strategy to those undergoing the training, to those teaching the training, and to local government officials and members of the press. It's important to repeat and accumulate this type of on-site cooperation in the field of maritime security and to work together with relevant countries to promote the peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region and the world. I'm confident that Japan and the United States will serve as good examples for this. Simultaneously, Advancing cooperation relating to disaster reduction and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the Indo-Pacific region, where large-scale natural disasters are common, is in the common interest of all countries in the region. And in fact, the Japan Self-Defense Forces are supporting Asian countries' national armed forces for capacity building. On the basis of this concept that I have outlined, Japan will combine various options, including OBDA, capacity building support, and defense equipment and technology cooperation in order to seamlessly support the capacity of other countries in safeguarding the seas. The free and open in the Pacific strategy is open to all the countries that endorse this vision. It by no means counters specific countries' newer initiatives. I hope that Japan and the United States will take the lead while also building up cooperation with India, Australia, ASEAN countries, and countries in South Asia to promote the peace, stability, and prosperity in this region. We'd like to facilitate collaboration with the United Kingdom, France, and other European countries as well as countries in the region. They have deep historical, political, and economic ties to the Indo-Pacific and may be able to pay great attention to this region. We'd like to collaborate and cooperate with all the countries that endorse our vision in order to ensure the stability and the prosperity 
of the Indo-Pacific region. Lastly, I'd like to touch briefly on North Korea, which poses an imminent threat of the region and the international community. We must not be blinded by North Korea's charm offensive or allow North Korea to play for time. The fact remains that North Korea is persistently continuing to pursue its nuclear and missile development programs. The only path to solving, resolving the issue by peaceful means is for North Korea to abandon its nuclear development and missile plans completely, verifiably, and irreversibly. As Prime Minister Abe confirmed with President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence, we must maximize pressure on North Korea by using all available measures, including through the full implementation of UN Security Council resolutions in order to compel North Korea to change its policy. I also look forward to hearing your views. So please be free and open as a like a future in the Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Minister Sonora. That was a very helpful and insightful elucidation of a term we've heard, uh, many of us, in different venues. But I think you really gave it some structure. And, and this is new and very helpful detail. I know I have a 1,000 questions, but um, <laughs> I'll only ask a few. And then um, at the Atlantic Council, we really welcome um, views and questions and from the audience. So uh, we appreciate you being here and engaging in, the, in this important conversation. I mean, when I heard the three pillars, and maybe it's because I'm at the Atlantic Council, but when I heard the three pillars of fundamental principles and values, of commercial and infrastructure development and strengthening these economies, and then of peace and stability, for some reason, my mind drifted to what we call the Marshall Plan. <laughs> and I would love your thoughts. I mean, that was a very successful post-World War II endeavor that I think helped connect the United States with certainly with our European allies and partners in a way that rebuilt Europe, strengthened the linkage between and among allies, and really helped to, we think, helped to generate a, a, one of the elements that helped to generate a long period of prosperity and security um, in, the, in the transatlantic space. And I would just love to hear your your additional thoughts on what I would call the geostrategic level of this very impressive um, outline of, of Japan's vision for the Indo-Pacific space. First of all, I should say, as I uh, said in my speech, that the Indo-Pacific region contains half of the world's population. The the ASEAN countries have uh, grown enormously in recent years, and also African countries possess a, a large number of uh, natural resources. Hakio 
And uh, so for that reason, we would like to be connected to these regions. We would also like to uh, be able to foster uh, economic growth uh, around the region, and uh, that's the kind of wave that we would like to be able to catch. Uh, Japan, as far as it is concerned, is now facing a shrinking birth rate and a, an aging population. So as our population decreases, it will be important for us to uh, be able to bring a, to have a connection to uh, these dynamic and economically growing regions. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just ask a few other questions sort of about the United States mm. and about China and India, and then we'll open it up to the broader audience. There, there are many who see a, a little bit of a relative withdrawal of the United States that in some ways began in the Obama administration, um, despite the announced pivot to Asia. Uh, and then with President Trump withdrawing from the TPP, it, some observers have said, well, Japan is really stepping up. And as Mr. Wilson said in the introductory remarks, you know, really playing a leading role in advocating and, and trying to reinforce a rules-based order uh, to maintain peace and stability in the region. And I wonder if, um, how does Japan see its role, the role that Prime Minister Abe has been playing and you? Um, and then once, once this Indo-Pacific approach has been stood up, is there some sort of tangible manifestation of it? Would there be an institution or is it more informal? Will there be a division of labor? you know, between the major parties that are involved in this vision, certainly India, as you discussed it, India, Japan, and the United States, and maybe others? Or is this more informal consultations? Mm. <laughs> この what I can say is that uh, there are many people who uh, say that the United States' presence is decreasing in the region. But as far as what I've seen, uh, and I've been to a number of ASEAN countries recently, uh, it seems to me that the Trump administration has made a clear commitment to ASEAN. Also, President Trump's visit to Asian nations was very important. So the people in that region do not necessarily feel the same way. あの、さっき申し上げたような as I touched on in my speech, there were four countries that uh, were involved in the military exercises in the Philippines, maritime exercises. Um, also there was uh, the uh, freedom of navigation operations which we support and uh, we would certainly welcome uh, any return by the United States to the TPP. あの、and as far as your question on division of labor, uh, it's certainly the case that no one country can deal with uh, terrorism issues and cyber issues on its own and guarantee um, uh, stability in the world. And everyone understands this, I believe. And that's why uh, we uh, do want to work with countries that share our democratic and uh, values based and other values uh, that we have with which we have these values in common. Tada. あ、日本の外交戦略の中心が日米同盟、日米関係にあることは、これは今後も変わりませんし、アメリカが世界の中で最も大きな役割を果たしてもらいたいというところもこれからも変わらないということは付け加えておきたいと思います。
But I should also add that uh, I do not anticipate any uh, change in our foreign policy, which is based on our um, alliance with the United States. That's been the case up until now. That will continue to be the case. Uh, it also, I think, uh, will be the case that we hope the United States uh, will play the largest role in the world, as it has done up until now, and we hope that that will continue. Thank you. Um, Last October, the Scowcroft Center released one of our many um, strategy papers from the Atlantic Council, and this was a, a, a proposed U.S. strategy for engaging in the Belt and Road Initiative. This strategy, in a nutshell, recommended uh, engaging wherever it is, meets our standards and wherever it uh, matches with U.S. and allies' interests. And um, you know, being clear with China where we're not engaging and where there are, th uh, there are activities happening that are not um, consistent with our interests. And I certainly heard in your remarks that this is open to, to countries like China, uh, the, your, your vision of an Indo-Pacific corridor. And my question is, and we would love for you to announce this at the Atlanta Council, what would be a good first step for China to engage with the U.S. and Japan in this Indo-Pacific, Indo uh, open and free and open Indo-Pacific. Is there a specific step China could take that um, you and Prime Minister Abe and, and the Trump administration would welcome? それから経済性、財政の持続性といったようなことを遵守をして経済発展をするんであればむしろ世界のためにプラスであるということで我々の側も歓迎すべきだと思います。touched on earlier, um, if we would be happy to work with the Chinese as long as they will adhere by the values of openness, of transparency, of economic growth, and of uh, fiscal uh, con continuity, fiscal continuity. Um, so as long as uh, China would be willing to uh, conform to these standards, uh, we think that that would lead to economic growth, which would, be, which would benefit the world as a whole. However, if there were any attempts to uh, provide uh, too much financing or if uh, the Chinese were to attempt to change the status quo uh, with, by military means, we would need to say that this is not acceptable. この国際スタンダードに合ったやり方にこれから変わっていくのか、それとも最後の質問にあったようなこうオフィシャルな会議体を考えているのかというと、これは今日米豪印が始まってるんで、そこで話を詰めていかなければならないと思いますし、アセアンとの間でもアセアンもう春に向かってですね、彼らの戦略を今考
Um, and also, uh, so we can't say anything at this moment. Also, uh, toward uh, the spring, ASEAN uh, is currently uh, involved in discussions as well about what to do. Uh, so what I can say is that uh, we need to set up a structure or a mechanism by which it will be easiest, easy for us to exchange views. Uh, and uh, we also want to be sure that we do not force our way of doing things on other parties. Great. Let me ask one more question and then would encourage the audience to um, get yours ready and we'll uh, engage uh, Minister Sonora uh, with, with your questions. At the Atlantic Council, we have the South Asia Center also, which is very engaged with um, Prime Minister Modi and the Indian government. And obviously, in this geographic space, you know, India is just indispensable to the success of the vision that you um, that you outlined, and I was wondering, are there particular specific things you, you, you think the, Indian, the Indians could play a, a, the most productive role in? Is it security cooperation? Is it development financing? Is it sort of foreign policy support? How do we um, help encourage India, who has been somewhat reluctant to engage in certain multilateral fora? How, do we, how can we best secure um, what, what's really critical for the success of this vision? あの、インド自身が外の成長力を自分たちに取り込むために今申し上げたような戦略が必要だというふうに理解をしていると思います。あの、我々が今やっているインド太平洋戦略とインドのいわゆるアクトイーストという戦略は非常に似通ったものだと思ってます。インドのアクトイースト似通っている。似て似ている。シミラー。And uh, as far as uh, India is concerned, I think that there is an understanding that it will be necessary for them to pull the outside forces of economic growth uh, to benefit themselves as well. And I think that's going to be a strategy they'll pursue. Um, and in, in, India also has the Act East policy, uh, which is very much in line with our thinking on this strategy. So in that way, for example, a cyber information center, in the Philippines, a center in Singapore, a recap center in a っていうことを考えるとやはりインドにもそうしたものに海の安全保障に積極的に関わってほしいと思ってますし我々はそういう話をしているからこそ先ほど申し上げたあの共同訓練も行ってます one thing, one thing we could envision perhaps is uh, setting up a pirate information center in India. Currently there is such a center in the Philippines, there's one in Singapore as well, uh, and also uh, Britain has a pirate information center in Dubai. Furthermore, we have a base uh, from which our vessels are launched uh, in Djibouti to help with these efforts. Uh, so I think that for uh, India it will be necessary for it to become involved in uh, maintaining maritime uh, uh, stability, uh, and I think that uh, it, that is part of the reason why we have been talking to them. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now I would love to open it to the floor. Um, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Uh, we're tweeting from the account at AC Scowcroft and with the hashtag AC Asia. So we'll take questions from Twitter as well, but also from the real world audience that I see in front of me. Uh, and the first question is our Board Director, Paula Stern. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for this very important presentation today. Um, as Barry mentioned, uh, the South uh, Asia Center um, operates um, with regard to India in particular. The, that's my question. And I, we just issued an issue paper, an issue brief that I wrote, um, on the notion of a uh, enhanced trade discussions uh, and agreements, particularly in the technology uh, arena, uh, that would engage Japan, uh, India, the U.S. in this context of an Indo-Pacific 
vision which you've described. Um, you didn't talk very much about trade, uh, though I understand when I visited India in November with the Atlantic Council that Japan uh, has a very impressive uh, series of initiatives, including one which, as I understand it, uh, will bring as many as 300,000 Indians to uh, Japan for various forms of training uh, uh, economically. Um, it sounds like uh, this may be news to uh, you, and it may not be true. But I would like you, more, more importantly, to talk about ways in which um, Australia, Japan, India uh, might uh, move ahead, particularly on trade, in, particularly in the areas of uh, technology, uh, goods, and services, because that's how we started the information uh, agreement in the first place uh, on information trade um, uh, when it was a U.S.-Japan bilateral, and it's been built up over the years. What you pointed out is very important. あ、いわゆる海上の安全保障を守りますとか、連結性を高めるというのは全て経済的な結びつきを増やして、貿易量を増やして、そして自由な投資をに結びついていくと我々も考えていますから、今おっしゃったようなことが戦略の向こうに次
uh, it is fully, uh, re, um, I would say, um, supported by Japanese people. And what will be the first step to start with it? Thank you. <laughs> Before answering, your question, before answering your question, I'd like to express my condolences for the earthquake that hit Taiwan recently. あの、日中というのはご存知の通り、隣同士ですから引っ越すことできませんので、普段から問題を多く抱えてますし、ある意味関係が良くなったり悪くなったりしてますけれども、今は先般の河野大臣の訪中。それからこれから迎えるべき日中間サミットというステップを踏みながら、いわゆる緊張緩和、関係改善に向かっているところは間違いないと思います。And of course, uh, Japan and China are neighbors, so we can't leave the neighborhood if it doesn't please us. We have to deal with each other. Um, and uh, while we do have many issues between us, uh, and our relationship does get better by turns and worse by turns, I think that there is a reason for optimism. Uh, one reason for that is the uh, visit by Foreign Minister Kono uh, to China, uh, as well as the uh, summit that will be held between uh, Japan, China, and uh, Korea soon. So I think we'll see a relax of tensions and a, a better relationship in general. で、and what the Prime Minister expressed about a willingness to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was premised on the idea of positioning it within uh, our uh, work on the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And also, it will be necessary for uh, China to adhere to uh, the conditions we have set out. And if that were to happen, then the Prime Minister has expressed his willingness to consider participation in the One Belt, One Road Initiative. だからそれはあの向こうのイニシアティブにそのままのっかるとかいう話じゃなくて、個別案件ごとに我々の利益になるもの、いわゆる日米合意の枠組みの中でプラスになるものについて個別に我々の and uh, further, that uh, uh, the, any participation by Japan uh, would have to benefit Japan as well. It would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll have to look at whether there will be a benefit to uh, Japan, China, I'm sorry, but Japan, the United States, Australia, and India. Those, that'll be another thing that'll play into the consideration. Thank you. Why don't we take some questions uh, in the back? Hi, Mark Mannion from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, Sonora Sensei, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how you feel South Korea and the role it plays in your vision of the Indo Pacific strategy. Um, we haven't heard much about South Korea, both when Prime Minister Abe was in office first time or this time in his vision, for example, of the Quad or Diamond Diplomacy. So what role do you think South Korea can play in promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific? Question. <laughs> 強調して対処しなければならない重要な国であります。uh, first of all, uh, South Korea is a very important country. It's currently dealing with how to respond to North Korea. It's also working on um, enhanced uh, understanding with its and communication with uh, Japan and the United States. あの、韓国とは、ま、総理自身が北朝鮮問題について主に話をしていると思いますけれども。
So much of what uh, the Prime Minister discusses with South Korea has to do with uh, North Korea. Uh, and we really have not launched yet into detailed discussions about any kind of role that South Korea could play in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. あの、彼らもプサンを含めてですね、いい港を持ってますし、そして核攻防撃、いわゆる防撃で成り立ってきた国でありますので、我々の戦略に賛同してくれるんであれば、我々としては当然仲間、いわゆる戦略に思いを同
and and Jordan, uh, those four countries. Um, and so this is a way in which we were able to uh, foster cooperation. I think that uh, India would be interested in, as well in being involved in such efforts uh, toward building peace in the Middle East and escaping from the uh, political trap that uh, currently exists. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this public event. Um, we are really honored, Mr. Minister, that you came to us and decided to outline um, important detail of the vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific here at the Atlantic Council. Thanks to you, we'll continue to go forward on helping elucidate this initiative, and we really um, look forward to working with you more, and thank you again. Thank you.